Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> Hey, don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila! Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click, get flexible payment options, then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Oh, wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to the nextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to sport our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee, or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Lamp Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered, like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films, head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. I'm Pete Wright. And I'm Andy Nelson. Welcome to The Next Reel. When the movie ends, our conversation begins. In just a matter of seconds, you're going to hear a classic episode of this show from back in the day when we called ourselves Movies We Like. It took us a while to settle into the show's format, so you'll notice some differences as you listen to these episodes. For instance, it takes us a bit of time to actually get into the conversation about the movie. Things like that. But we're still proud of the conversations about the movies themselves, and we think they're worth keeping in the library. So enjoy these episodes from our back catalog. And you can become part of our Discord community, learn more about the show, and find out how you can become a supporting member at thenextreel.com. So thank you, everybody, for downloading and listening to The Next Reel. We appreciate your time and attention, and we hope you enjoy the show. Required reading, Fall of Civilization. Those who don't read Thurber, Fall of Civilization. You heard it here first. <laughs> How are you, Andrew? Did you, did you just are you are you from like the uh, the Bostonian like twenties? Is that where you just went to? The Plaza. It's not Mister Godsby. <laughs> <laughs> Let's. Uh, how are you, Andrew? It is uh, as always. It has been way too long. It's. I, I'm fantastic, and yes, it has. You are. You were a little bit under the weather, and you sound like you've recovered. I'm drinking my 
my uh, tea from uh, our favorite hometown of Boulder. Mm. The lovely celestial seasonings. Mm. Lemon zinger. Celestial seasonings. Yep, mm-hmm. Put you know celestial seasonings. Put Boulder on the map. I don't know if you heard about that. Well, it's would have been you know, known for nothing else. But tea from the aliens. Tea. <laughs> um i uh uh, i'm good thanks for asking it's been a treat (laughs) good um uh, (laughs) it's a good week family's gone camping and so i'm here alone i'm a little bit stir crazy didn't Uh, they just go camping oh that was a lot yeah well actually my daughter daughter was was on her little hunger games camp she was she survived and now she's on She's off at another camp this week. I don't know why it, you'd think we don't, don't want her around. That's still, <laughs> <laughs> I promise you, she loves these camps. Like she just she maybe she doesn't want to be around us. <laughs> I have never thought about that. That's terrible. Whoa, she just keeps revelation to go to camps. Uh, uh, so she's at another camp, and my wife and my son they went to it. They went camping by themselves to get away from me. So I'm here with my cats. I'm the I'm the cat man. Wow. Mm-hmm. Uh, it it has been a treat watching this movie we're going to talk about tonight. Like a Halloween treat. It's been really delightful. Mm, a uh, bloody Halloween treat. <laughs> you know, surprisingly, well, we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, we're talking about Blood Simple tonight. Uh, Nineteen, uh, what was it? Eighty four. Yeah, eighty five. Eighty something. Eighty four. Eighty five. Cohen Brothers. My I and. Uh, um, it has, uh, yeah, it was their first film. Yeah. Are we, first are we film. talking about it already? No, or no, we... we're not. This is, a, this you're is just, a you're setup. just introducing preamble. it. Okay. Gotcha. This is the preamble. Uh, and, uh, so it's their first film. We're going to be talking about that in a moment. Uh, and uh, we're very excited to start our Coen brothers series. Yeah. Kind of, kind of a dramatic Coen brothers yeah, series. Yeah. yeah. The drama of the brothers Coen. Mm-hmm. Ooh, that's uh, a good title. The brothers Coen. The, the drama, drama of the, bro- the, drama the, of the brothers Cohen. Should we? Do, mm-hmm. That's the name of our series. Yes. Drama of the brothers Cohen. Uh, and, but first, uh, this is the next reel. You're listening to the next reel. My name's Pete Wright, and that there is Andy Nelson. Uh, he is pleased to meet you all. And uh, we, you can find us at thenextreel.com, uh, where you can see all of the films we've talked about. You can uh, check out the film board with the films uh, we do on our monthly special series, uh, new release films. You can look at the extras. We have a new menu. Have you explored mm-hmm. the menu, the extras menu? It's like a DVD menu. It's, it's, it's in, all sorts of that, Easter eggs and everything. It's Easter eggs in, in that it's very little like a DVD menu. But you, that, if yeah. you click on it, you can browse by series. This is all the extra stuff. Yeah, hence the name that we couldn't really find a place for. So you can find, this is the most important one, you can find the cost per minute breakdown of all the films that we have talked about that Andy has been slaving over. It's his, his prize spreadsheet. And that's adjusted for inflation. Adjusted for inflation, <laughs> that's right. Uh, along with our flick chart, top 100. Uh, although, thanks to your sick days, we are super caught up on Letterboxd. We have a new yeah, Letterboxd. Yeah, nothing, nothing like being sick to really just plow through those sorts of things. So yeah, Letterboxd, uh, we've got all of our films in there. All of our uh, little uh, uh, type-ups for each of them. All the film board stuff, everything. So we're you know taking off. Totally new for us, the Letterboxd, um, mm-hmm. and so uh, we're very excited to be there. Follow us if you're on Letterboxd. If you haven't used it, you should explore it. It looks like a, a great tool. My own personal account is woefully uh, understocked. Uh, <laughs> I, need to get, I need to get on it. But yours is, is great. So do, yeah, so do I've, Greek film. Yeah, I've been playing around with it. It's, it is a great little place to just track everything you're watching, write up little reviews, read other people's reviews, comment. Yeah, just kind of... Connect with other film folk. Outstanding. Let's do trailers. Let's. You go first. I am very excited about my trailer tonight. I had a totally different trailer ready to go. And then 15 minutes before we started, I found this trailer, which trumped everything else. Not just because I'm super excited about it, but also because it's opening in limited release this Friday. As in today, the day this show comes out. So... Go see it if you have it playing near you in a theater. You heard it here first. (laughs) That's right. Otherwise, rent it as soon as you can. It is Drew, the man behind the poster. This is a documentary about the legendary Drew Struzan, of course, the amazing 
movie poster artist who has been doing movie posters for 30 some years now. And truly, I think some of the most iconic movie posters that are out there, definitely the ones that stick in my mind more than probably most any other movie poster. And uh, like he's done all the Star Wars posters. He's done the Indiana Jones films, the Back to the Future films. You know, he does uh, films for uh, Frank Darabont. He did a great one for Shawshank Redemption and The Mist and Guillermo del Toro, Pan's Labyrinth, your favorite. Even really crappy movies like Masters of the Universe, he makes that poster look like something that you want to see. Or he makes the movie look like something you want to see. I wonder, which, I wonder which actor he has painted the most. I'm thinking Harrison I'd, Ford. I would say Harrison Ford. I mean, that you know, three Star Wars films, three Indiana Jones films. Blade Runner. Yeah. And, and, and Blade Runner. And not just the Star Wars films once, but at least twice, yeah. because he had all the re-releases in, the, in 97 uh, when they re- were all remastered. Right, with all right. the mm. Looks like a great film. And you know what? I couldn't, I couldn't help but walk away with this. I, uh, we, uh, you know, it, this sounds really... I, how do I put this to make it not sound like I'm a tool? Um, well, we all know you're a tool, so it's okay. All right, so we'll take that as a given. <laughs> we should all be so lucky to have people talk about us, to have one person talk about us the way these people talk about Drew Struzan. Absolutely. I mean, I just I walk away from that movie feeling so warm from this trailer, feeling so warm about the you know how wonderful it is that they are sharing uh, these such fantastic sentiments about this guy's just talent and gift for understanding story through these paintings, these works of art. It's amazing. Oh, it absolutely is. So. And it's just, it's, it's stunning stuff. He's got some coffee table books out there. We can uh, post a link on our, in the show notes to the book and uh, we'll definitely get something up for the trailer, but definitely go check it out. Um, I think it actually looking at the release, it sounds like it's just going to be opening in New York limited and uh, then it'll probably, you know, get a little more of a release and then uh, be off to uh, DVD and digital. Mm. Really looks great. Looks I can't great. wait. Really can't wait. Uh, my trailer. I think it did it hit last week or this week. It's a pretty new trailer. Uh, it Film. is a pretty new trailer. Uh, it is CBGB. CBGB Randall Miller directed film uh, written by Jody Savin and Randall Miller. Uh, starring a lot of freakishly awesome people. What a great cast is in here. No uh, kidding. Uh, Malin Ackerman, Ryan Hurst, Stana Kattuk, Johnny Galecki, Ashley Green, Alan Rickman. Alan Rickman. Yeah. Uh, Rupert Grint. On a mm-hmm. kind of grand. I mean, it's just, it's a great, great. Bradley Whitford, please. Donald Logue. Yeah. It really is just a amazing cast. And Alan Rickman, it's rare that he is given such a central role in a film. You know, yeah, he's such yeah. a great supporting player and to see him in, in, you know, kind of the central right. role of the film is just, it's really exciting. Now the story of the film is look at the New York city punk rock, uh, uh scene as told through the opening of this club, CBGB, um, in, in New York city and, uh, what happened to this club and how it just sort of took over, uh, and, and became an organism in itself. And, uh, um, you know, it is, um, it's just a, a beautiful tale of some of my, you know, very, very favorite, um, artists from the time. Um, you know, it goes from the Ramones to Debbie Harry to, you know, uh, Lou Reed to uh, a little bit of, uh, the police, Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just a, it's a fantastic trailer. It's a lot of fun Talk, to see. You just talking heads, talking are in heads. That. Absolutely, yeah. it's just you just giddy at the end of it of how how, how uh, cool it is to see them portray all these um, all these great bands. And you know, here's hoping they do it. You know, that they do justice to it. And and um, so very much looking it's, forward to this trailer. It's one of those tricky things. I yeah. mean, you have so many people in this film. Uh, playing all these you know famous musicians and i'm assuming that they're just all going to be lip syncing but it's you know it could it could work or it could uh, you know become a little bit of a uh I, I don't want to call it a parody but it it could turn into something that just kind of is a little more painful to watch but you know looking at the trailer i feel like 
they're going to do it right. Well, and that's that's uh, that's exactly my thing too. It's like you know, they, it, it could be a movie that they make just to have a lot of the names in it. You know what I mean? Like the poster is is so full of names that it it you know about the music that it could be a film designed to promote the soundtrack. Yeah, right. And it totally and looks that way. It it, it kind of like that that would be a real shame if it became that kind of a film. So, yeah. uh, still very much looking forward to it. It sure as hell would be a great soundtrack. Let's just say. Well, that. if nothing else, it's so much fun watching Alan Rickman just yeah. yell at all these great famous. I know. <laughs> band members and everything because he's just you know whether they're too noisy or whatever it's just hilarious right right yeah this is a great uh, looks like a great trailer so check it out uh, on the website the next dot com and uh, you will find it uh, well you'll find it under this week's episode that's what I got for my trailer and that's coming out in October right October 20 October 11th 2013 US release yeah looking forward to it yep should be good shall we cool. do this shall we do it Let's. You know, let's I'm, talk he, about the drama of the the drama brothers, of the brothers Cohen. Cohen. <laughs> God, this was a great movie, wasn't it? It is. This is a really great movie. This is a movie that. No, you say funny. that so academically. Like I whispered it. Like I uh, I whispered it because of the passion. This was a great oh. movie. And, and you're I, just like, I spoke this really was a study. great movie. Yeah, it's like you're just like an academic, a pinhead. Apparently an academic from a, a strange foreign country with a, a quirky accent. Is that what I am? I've already forgotten his name. Lieber <laughs> Kolb. Kol Kino Lorber. Kino, Kino Lorber. Lorber. All right, so tell me why, Dr. Nelson, please tell me why. This is a great film. This is a film that I think... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. This is a film that's just... <laughs> is that better? A little bit. <laughs> I'm trying to get my passion out. God, get it on there. Come on, man. I'm a little sick. It hurts. <laughs> try, it. Try, try it again. <laughs> this film... <laughs> I swear, I'm going to... I'm stepping up. <laughs> No, really. This is this is uh, this is a great film to watch. It, it's interesting because I didn't watch this film when it came out. I was a little too young, probably not even the sort of film that was on my parents' radar when it came out. And uh, even if it was, they definitely would have taken me to it because just the title alone, "Blood Simple," is just not the sort of film they would have been taking me to. Um, I didn't see this until college. And I remember watching it. Uh, a friend in in uh, in college recommended it to me, and I watched it and go, "Wow, what a what a like a twisty film." It was just so complex, and, and he's like, "Yeah, but it's really not if you think about it." And then I thought about it. I'm like, "It's really not very complex. It really is a very straightforward story." And uh, but there's something about just the the way the story plays out, the way the Coens write this story. And, and have these characters interact. And something that they use quite a bit in, in their films, kind of dumb characters, these people make just bad decisions. And we watch them making bad decisions. And, and we're always kind of in the know. We have this omniscient presence as we watch this film, seeing these characters you know, leave things behind or just, you know, leave the scene of a crime without realizing that uh, something else was there that was amiss, all that sort of stuff. We're very much more in tune than they are. But through all of that, it creates this more complex emotional level with these characters as they work out trying to deal with the situation that they've now put themselves in. And I think that's what I, I found when I first watched it. And the more I watch it, I, I really enjoy the characters and their interaction, particularly uh, the wonderful M. Emmett Walsh as the, as the detective, and, uh, or not the detective, but the private investigator. And, uh, and watching these characters interact with each other, I think is just so much fun as they deal with all these bad decisions that they keep making. I love it. I love it more now than I did when I first saw it. See? 
<laughs> wow. I, uh, no, I, I really, it. I, I love this There's movie. There's nothing no academic one... about that. No. <laughs> <laughs> I would marry it, sir. I would marry this movie. Um, I, this is what I love about this movie. It is, it, it is not, um, it, it, you're right, it's not complicated. It's a film noir revenge story. Uh, that goes horribly wrong. But what I love so much about it is that this is a film that exists so firmly cemented in its own present, right? There is no sense that these characters have any ability to reason beyond where they are at that given moment in that space at that time, right? Uh, mm-hmm. That these clumsy mistakes uh, and, and these sort of strange realizations that they come to, these the, they make sense of their environment without any of the gift of hindsight or foresight, right? Um, that, uh, you know, I- example, that John gets, uh, you know, what's his name? Ray. Ray. Man. It's just, <laughs> you know, okay. So that he, uh, oh, you know, so uh, John gets goes into, um, uh, goes into the uh, bar. After the great uh, Dan Hedaya has been, well, uh, spoilers, go see this movie. Uh, <laughs> Dan Hedaya has been shot. He goes in here and he's dead and he trips over and, and the gun goes off and he sees all this evidence and then he begins to react as if he actually killed Dan Hedaya, right? I mean, he begins mm-hmm. to do the cleanup and to hide the body and to do all of these things. Uh, and, and you get the feeling that he... You know, we we know we can make rational sense. He didn't do it. We know he didn't do it, and we know his reaction is, is you know, oh my gosh, you know, I'm I'm in going into panic state, but it's an irrational panic state that is so, um, it, it feels so sort of delusional, like hot Texas sun delusional, uh, uh, because of the, of the state that he is in, and he goes and and it sets in motion uh, this unreal series of events. Uh, that seems so perfectly rationalized in each scene, but when taken on the whole, you wonder how did this possibly happen? Like how did they how did they get there? I know that it makes sense that he left the lighter underneath the fish, and I know that it makes sense that that uh, you know that the gun some it has been put in pocket to pocket to pocket. I you know I get as as they are as they are playing with props and playing with locations that, that these things happen and they make so much sense in that very moment. And, and yet it ends up coming up with this fantastical, like fairy tale of a film noir story of, that ends on a completely, uh, you know, senselessly violent climax uh, that, that ends up being, uh, you know, contrary to what you would expect, really rewarding. Yeah, it is. It is. Well, <laughs> especially because it's so hard figuring out who to really like in this film because nobody's really that likable. Well, and that's the whole point, right? I mean, yeah, that's they're, what they're... is being celebrated. It's like that film noir thing we've been talking, we have talked about a, a lot. Nobody is, there is no winner here. There's no good guy. Yeah, and there's. it's hard to even pinpoint who's really the protagonist in this, in this film. You could say that it's Frances McDormand's character, Abby, um, she's the one who gets away, but you know she's involved she's the one in who's this. having an affair. Yeah, she's having an affair on her husband, and um, granted, she's trying to get out of the relationship, I guess. And but you know, she just seems like a not bright lady, and uh, it's just you know making bad decisions. The uh, M. Emmett Walsh, oddly, is I think the most enjoyable character to watch, as much as he is, uh, as much as you despise him, because he's just. Is sleazy, slimy. I mean, he's like, he's like a bug. He dresses in this ugly yellow suit that makes him almost just kind of this uh, sickly insect-like sort of person. He drives a VW Bug. He's got that fly flying around on him. It's just like he attracts insects. It's just like there's something right. so repulsive about him. But his his humor, the way he laughs, the way he talks, his voiceover in the film. Everything, even the last moment when he does w- uh, another spoiler alert. Again, we spoil movies here, so just consider the movie spoiled once you start listening. Uh, when he gets killed or shot by her at the end, and he's dying, and he's just laying under the sink and laughing and everything, you still absolutely enjoy him. 
and it doesn't matter that much that he's dead because he figured it was coming anyway. And it's like, yeah, it's, it's, it's just great fun characters to watch through the course of the film as they all kind of swim around in the excrement of this world that they're in. It's re- it, it really is horrible. And that gets back to, to you know, I think the, the feeling at the end of the film, you know, you, when, when you see what they have ma- made of themselves through uh, all of this just clumsiness, the, the way they live their lives, you know, and this, this just sort of clumsy stumbling through um, this, these uh, various set pieces. Uh, you, you, I, I'm left thinking, you know, they have each earned what they got. Yeah. Right? I mean, they have earned the end of their individual arc, in, however it happened. Um, and boy, I'm excited to talk about Dan Hedaya. <laughs> Speaking of a character who lives in the moment, or it, just everything about the film, like you said, it's all in the moment of this film that we're watching. There's no sense that I can ever make watching this film of why Abby, uh, Francis McDormand's character, would and Dan, ever. Uh, would ever marry Julian, uh, Dan Hedaya's character. There's, there's no logical rationale why these two people would have ever hooked up in the first place. Julian is so slimy and gross. There's nothing about him that's likable, but somehow she did. And now, obviously, she wants to get out of it, so she's having this affair with Ray. Well, and I would, I would throw into there. I mean, there is that sequence where she's looking at old pictures. Uh, where they, they show the old pictures of him, them in bathing suits, and he looks young and strong and sort of vital. Yeah. Uh, and so you get a sense of what the past was. It's not a very sort of uh, you know, strong sense, but, you, you know, they, they seem to like each other at one point. But that is, in, in some ways, one of the things I like about the film is that there isn't— uh, it, back to that sense of the present that I was rambling on about, that, there you know, with the exception of these little flashbacks that we get through uh, trophies, like the photos— there is no sense uh, that the film is paying any sort of homage to that history for these characters. Right. Right. I mean, there's, you, we, we see that little flash, but then really we're, we're just going to move on and deal with, with the now. Yeah, absolutely. It's not reminiscent at all. Exactly. Yeah. All right. You talk some more. You were, I interrupted you. And then... Oh, well, no, but, but Dan Hedaya, though, yeah. it, you know, he, he definitely is a character that there's never a moment where you, are given a chance to connect with him in those reminiscent moments or anything. It's always this just spiteful, hateful, malicious man. Uh, granted, he finds out that his wife is having an affair, but you get a sense that this is how he is anyway, right? right? right. You never get this impression that he's, you know, he's normally smiling until, until the <laughs> detective gives him these photos. He's always a grump. He's always a grump, or he's vomiting, uh, and then he's a grump again. Right? Yeah. He throws up three good times. Once he got kicked in the groin real, real hard. So, okay. Right. But otherwise, okay. So we get to what I love so much about Dan Hedaya in this, in this scene. Dan Hedaya and John Getz. Mm-hmm. Uh, like the Red Shoes, where we have mm-hmm. this beautiful ballet right in the middle of the film that takes us to a new dark place. Yes. I think this 20-minute sequence, right in the middle of uh, Blood Simple, is akin to this ballet. It is the hot Texas ballet of the Coen brothers, right? Yeah. There is silence, because the characters have all come to this point in each of their presence where they don't need to say anything else about yeah. what's going to happen next. And yet it is a cavalcade of... Uh, uh, these just clumsy attempts at horror that get progressively worse uh, as John Getz tries to find a way to kill the unkillable Dan Hedaya. <laughs> right. <laughs> and uh, well, so he finds him, right, because he's been, uh, to quote, killed by M. Emmett Walsh, uh, mm-hmm. but it turns out he's still alive. So as, as John Getz is trying to, to dispose of the body, he hears he's driving down the road with, with uh, Dan Hedaya's character in the back and, uh, of the car, and he hears him start to make some noise. And so he gets out of the car and he runs off into a field, only to discover that Hedaya is um, still alive. He's gotten out of the car. He's not much of a threat. He's no. now, you know, crawling across the, the road. Uh, and John well, Getz... He's- 
He's only a threat in the sense that he, he's still alive. He could be. He could lead to exposure yes. because the truck is coming. Right, right, right. But he's not a physical threat. Like no, you know, no. we get this sense of escalating fear as as Gates right. runs out into the field. He thinks that there is there is a, a physical threat uh, from from Julian's uh, Julian in the back seat. So when he comes back and he sees that Julian is is you know crawling, scraping along the highway. It, we we start to see the the sort of mechanics of of Ray as he uh, as he tries to uh, to make sense of what he's going to do next, uh, and he try he thinks of all sorts of different ways he, to to um, to try to do this horrific thing to kill uh, once and for all Julian Marty and uh, you know he goes at him with a shovel he he he's uh, um, and and finally as it gets progressively more horrible he finally gives up. And just buries him alive. <laughs> the most nightmarish like, way to do somebody in. He buries him alive. The guy can't breathe. He's been shot in the lung. Uh, and he just starts pouring dirt on his face. Yeah, it's horrible. It is just horrible. It's the worst. It's the well, worst. It, and apparently the film, at one point before the director's cut came out, there was a quote by Hitchcock at the beginning of the film um, that he had said, I don't know, I think it was around the time he did, I want to say Torn Curtain, mm. um, where it said, it is very difficult, very painful, and it takes a very, very long time to kill someone. That is, uh, that is great that you brought that up. I was, I was actually thinking about that. One of the things that sort of this movie celebrates to me is just how resilient the human body is, even the right. great big fat human bodies that, you know, and bodies that don't take care of themselves. And <laughs> right, uh, it, it appears that that's what this film. One of the things this film is celebrating. Yeah, absolutely. In a really awful way. It it is it truly is awful, and uh, you know I think it's it it speaks to that noirish sensibility that you have this really interesting situation where, I, I mean Ray is really doing this because he thinks Abby shot him, you know, and yeah. and so he's he's trying to protect this woman that he loves, right? Um, as much as you can call it uh, love in a relationship that's that's you know born out of an affair. It's it you know it just it all feels very uh, I don't know a little animalistic the way that when they're making love it's just as so you know the the way the lights are going and everything it's this it's this very carnal sort of scene right mm -hmm. it just doesn't it doesn't seem like there's love there it's just kind of this you know base lust that they have right regardless she or he thinks that she killed him so he's going through all of this stuff it just feels so noirish he feels like such the noir a person not that she really comes across as a femme fatale but he really comes across as kind of the the man in a noir film who's kind of caught up by a femme fatale and and as much as he wants to you know pull out of that and not get not get caught he is caught in this web by this person that that he really can't deal with his he can't emotionally break free of and has to get in into this situation and that's exactly what really gives this film that that noir feel and that's why it's kind of i guess classified as a neo noir yeah you know we've talked about neo noir i i i think you're you were on the record as saying that's not something we're thinking real hard about I mean, what? if it's noir, neo? it's noir. Yeah, neo noir. I mean, where do you stand on neo noir? Have you updated well, your opinion on this? No, I mean, noir. You know, the the film noir technically is a series like films that came out from about about the Maltese Falcon to yeah. um, uh, what is the what is the film I'm blanking on? It's like late fifties. I can't remember the name of the film. Um, Touch of Evil, that's what it is, it's the Orson Welles. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's kind of the general period of noir. Everything after, people were playing with the conventions that came out of that. And so there was a lot of conventions of the noir, but they were also playing with the conventions. And so it became this neo-noir, you know, I don't know, it's like, it's like all these different classes of paintings, you know, is it, is it romantic? Oh no, it's, it's post-romantic or whatever, you know, it's, it's, it's taking a, period and, and doing something with it. So I guess I'd say it's neo-noir because it doesn't fully fit in, but it definitely has a lot more noir in it than some neo-noirs do. 
Yeah, I yeah, I can see that. I what I don't like about neo noir is that it, you know, it saddles a, um, y- you know, it it saddles a genre that can never end, right? Everything is neo if it had attributes of film noir and was made after 1960 or 1951. Well, somebody so, needs to just come up with a new term. Uh, well, maybe that's right. <laughs> anyway. But, I mean, if, if this were a noir film, I mean, technically, I guess maybe John Getz's character would be the one who, you know, m- she, or maybe she's not the one who would make it through to the end. Maybe she would get killed by the by uh, the detective. I don't really know. But Well, yeah, and that assumes she, she you know, she gets off easy. I mean, I don't I don't just because she's, you know, she lives yeah, right. doesn't mean she's not damaged yeah, every other person around her is is gone yeah this was and um, nobody really knows what happened to the ten thousand dollars right right just vanished mm-hmm. um this was francis mcdormand's first film i i guess the story as as i understand it is they were initially going to cast holly hunter in the role of abby and Holly Hunter, uh, she'd met with them and everything, and she said, you know, I think my roommate is probably a better choice for this. And I, I, I think, or her college, her roommate from college or something, who happened to be Frances McDormand. They met her, and I guess they agreed with Holly because they ended up casting uh, Frances McDormand in it. And that's where, so this was really kind of her big, her big, you know, um, leading lady debut. And... This is also where she met her future husband, Joel Cohen. What's, uh, why, uh, she is such a unique actress, this Frances McDormand. Mm-hmm. This movie, uh, you know, it, yeah. man, it's, it, she's so unique. Just her physical appearance is so unique. But in this movie, she is, I think, uh, falls more in line with the stereotypically beautiful soft skin young you, you know she was she she was much less of a character um in this film than i think she has played in uh later films particularly the later cohen films but you know um much of her work is is much more character oriented she's kind of a um, strikes me as a a character actress in a really sort of purist sense yeah, and but and I'd say you know yes she has kind of that that pretty look in this but at the same time it's a very plain look it's yeah. not like she's made up she's not wearing makeup through the film I mean she just looks very unmade up but natural and I guess naturally beautiful yeah but but through all of that I think that gives her that feeling of that simplicity as well that you know that again they kind of tend to tell these stories about simple people and she does kind of have that feel right right. And and she you know she stands out in stark contrast to these three other idiots that she's on screen with, yeah uh, you know who are just really I mean they're just idiots, they are. Uh, but I you know I love her in this film I think she does a she she does a great job and and um, uh, you know she she provides a, a she's not on screen as much as you would expect right I mean she's. Um, you know, she's on, and then much of the, you know, certainly much of the balance of the drama of the film is is between, you know, John Getz and and others, and then she's in the big climax and and uh, ends up, you know, doing some. Nice, yeah, that's a nice that's damage. a great. The climax of this film is is so much fun to watch. It really, really is just a solid end to the film. The way that they play all of that, the interesting spatial. Um, stuff going on within the story about the different rooms and and just you know who is where i i really enjoy that it just you know how he's shooting through the wall and it, it just all of that's really yeah. fun to- I'll, I'll tell you i you know what I, what i love so much about the geometry of the film at the end you know when you're talking about the layout and the way they play with these rooms that in so far as you know m emmett walsh's character uh, you know detective private detective lauren visser is um, you know, chasing her around, trying to make sense of kind of what room they're in after the, you know, across the alleyway shootout. Uh, it, you can't really make sense of it until uh, the very last 
you know, bit as he is reaching around the corner to try to to get into the window next door. Mm-hmm. And and that's when suddenly the spatial pieces fall into place. It's like a, it, it's like a physical sort of a spatial punchline. Uh, and you realize just how close they are together and where she was and how the bathroom is oriented with these uh, with these other rooms and how the only way she could have gotten out is through the outside and, and kind of how that works. Um, and I, uh, you know, I really... I really like that, and that it that that punchline is also the you know the sort of graphic kind of most violent, um, or at least the bloodiest of the punchlines of the film. Um, uh, yeah, I, I really. This... Re- it's ahead. it's just it's it just I'm sorry to interrupt. It's just but it really reveals that that sense of um, you know like I was saying that omniscience that we have that no one else seems to have. And how this entire thing that she's going through is under the assumption that it's she's running from a different person, right? You know, which I, it's just just very. I find that very interesting. Well, and yeah, we didn't talk about that. Talk about talk more about that about that twist. Well, it's I, I I'm not sure how much more I have to say about it, other than it is a really interesting twist that here she is under the like she has no clue that her her husband had put this detective on their tail, that this detective was trying to kill them, that this detective had killed her husband, that her boyfriend had subsequently then really killed her husband. Like, she's she's really the one who's most clueless in this film. Yes. And totally she's really just dark. kind of... she's to, in, a, in a way, that makes her, I guess you could say, the innocent. She's just assuming that she and, and Ray had this affair, and Ray is kind of dealing with... Uh, Julian in some way that she may find unsavory but doesn't want to know about. She just assumes that it's just arguments and fights and, you know, coming down to fisticuffs in the bar, all that sort of stuff. I think nowhere has her head gone to this horrible world of murder that is in the heads of these three other people. And it's not until she's standing there with Ray when all of a sudden his chest explodes from a bullet um, shot by the detective that she's really kind of thrown into this last desperate act of survival. Right. And, and Ray didn't make it any better by uh, misappropriating his own anger at her mm-hmm. uh, and not telling her what happened during the Texas ballet. Right. Uh, you know, and and um, and so as they move further apart, she just sort of cements her cluelessness. Yeah. Yeah, and all the way up through the end where, like I said, she's assuming that the person pursuing her is her husband coming at her because he's angry and has no idea what's going on. Right, right. I mean, she and, and she leaves this film knowing nothing about where her husband is. That's right. That's she right. has no clue. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good point. She walks yeah. away with nothing. <laughs> Uh, Except maybe the dog, because the dog disappeared somewhere, too. Yeah, that's right. The dog's just still running out in the field. The dog's digging. Yes, the, the animatronic um, dog. So um, uh, we have... Uh, gosh, what did I want to say? You had me. You had it, and then you started talking about something else, and now it's gone. Curses, I don't know. Was it, was it John Getz? Nope, nope, nope. Oh, it was back to the ending and, and uh, sort of the, the, the violent part. Uh, when you first saw this, was it a, was it a big surprise? Yeah. I mean, I, I wasn't expecting it to go quite the way that it went. Um, yeah, like I said, I mean, I, I wasn't expecting, uh, it, it, it's called blood simple. So, I mean, I guess to some extent I'm expecting blood, but I, I don't know if I was expecting it to get quite so, quite so uh, physical at the end with the, like the knife and all that sort of stuff. But, uh, it is very noirish, so I wasn't that surprised. I don't think. Um, I, the what I love so much about it is, you know, I think living up to the title is is one of the objectives of <laughs> a film like this, right? You're going to make a yep. movie called Blood Simple. You better have a way to live up to it, and and you you sort of think they get off the hook when when Dan Hedaya's character is shot, because what what is left that John Getz walks into is a, you know, a, a lot of blood on the floor that he has to clean up and scrub and scrub, and it just won't get clean. And, uh, you know, he's he's got to clean up this giant mess. And so you think, okay, well, there's they've 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 checked off blood. 
uh, mm -hmm. from the from the film. Uh, but then at, at the end, you know, the the sort of legendary stabbing as as M. Emmett Walsh is reaches around the uh, the uh, the wall outside the the apartment building and right. and as he puts his hand inside on the um, on the the uh, frame, uh, Francis McDormand, you know, she slams the window on his hand and then stabs him and pins him with this uh, with this large knife uh, pins him to the frame through his hand and yeah. there, there's a lot of blood and it happens fast but then they really stick to it <laughs> and they show it they show her twisted in there to make it really stick they they nail it yeah uh, it's, and it's just it's you, you sense you sense the pain of that as he's now Pounding at the wall, he's With first shooting at the wall. Of his head, he's and he's, then pounding at the wall to to get his hand uh, through to free himself. It's it is brutal. It, it really is, is. It's really brutal. He he just he you feel like he is a he's an animal trapped like a like a bear trap. You know, I mean, you just get yeah. that feeling that he's going to eat his hand off, chew his hand off. Yeah, no kidding. Um, it's and, like and, saw, right? And <laughs> watching him try to pull it out. Uh, is, yeah. It it's is. Really it's a pain to watch. It is. But you know what I? It, you know, it, this is. I remember what it was. I was going to say. So this is one of the, the one of the bits from, um, um, you know, the the inspiration of the title, is is from this uh, Dashiell Hammett novel, Red Harvest, mm. uh, and they talk about uh, blood simple as. Uh, let's see. The term to describe the addled, fearful mindset of people after a prolonged immersion in violent situations. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's one of the things I think that's so neat about the pacing. <laughs> it's neat. It's just <laughs> neat about the pacing of the violence in this film that by the time you get to the end, uh, you, you're, you're sort of ready for it, you know, and I think they kind of make good. And uh, that's another make good on the title of the film that, that, uh, that, that they, they build really nicely in terms of the scale of the violence and the, and the thrill um, to the end. It's just it's most... Um, you know, the burial alive, that's a suspense, kind of a thriller, kind of horror, uh, leading up to the stabbing and the beating through the wall, which is just a, a violent, overt horror. Um, and uh, it, it works really well. Well, and I think they play with those um, expectations as well. There's the scene with Ray and Julian when Ray comes to collect his, you know, last two weeks of pay or whatever. And he and Julian are sitting outside and it's this very interesting con conversation between the two of them. Just it's very kind of this tense conversation between these two men. They know what's going on. A lot of hate, a lot of, you know, uh, barbs with the, their looks. And in between them, in the background, is an incinerator. And these people are throwing furniture and whatnot into this incinerator. And it's just, it's, nobody talks about it. It's just there sitting in the back of the shot, totally setting up the gun on the mantelpiece. We're expecting <laughs> this incinerator to come into play. And they play with that expectation by setting it up and having that shot where we're seeing this incinerator and we go, oh, who's going to end up in the incinerator? And then when it's so easy to, to throw the body into the incinerator, once he actually <laughs> has it in his car, he, he you doesn't. think he's driving up to the incinerator to unload the body. But no, he's just dumping his blood-soaked windbreaker. <laughs> <laughs> he's going to do something else with the body. God only knows what until it starts coming back to life. Which is so, it, yes, it's so it. And, you know, I want to take you back a minute because it's not just that they were, you know, throwing trash and furniture in there. They were throwing rolled up carpet that looks yeah. like you could have rolled a body in it. Like it was mimicking <laughs> what should have happened if this guy exactly. had been even in his right mind at all. And they, they just tease you with it over and over again. Yeah, you see that incinerator quite a bit. And it's just, it's it's a really interesting uh, technique that they use in this to set up that gun on a mantelpiece that we've talked about before and how you set it up and you better use it. Well, these guys play to that convention in a really interesting way where you kind of leave that scene going, well, what a flippin' idiot. Why didn't he use it? Only to lead us to the scene that you, you know, the Texas Ballet 
where all of a sudden you're like, wow, okay, well, this is this is what happens when he doesn't use that gun on the mantelpiece. Yeah. Now it's a horrific scene that he has to go through. Likewise, leading us to the, the moment at the end. It's just setting us up for these horrific moments by teasing us with, with simpler ways out, I guess. Well, and... Uh, that's one of the things I think that is earned in this film by, by you know, you mentioned a little uh, in the beginning that, that there's a sense that these characters are simple and they, they sort of are thinking simply and they don't make those, um, those connections. It's like they're, they're, um, you know, they, they, he didn't make the connection to use the incinerator. And so that got him into much more trouble, mm-hmm. uh, as a result. And yet he was believable in each of those moments. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Right. 100%. Yeah. Okay. Well, good. I'm glad, we, glad we're up to speed on that. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Barry Sonnenfeld. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Um, <laughs> by the way, Barry Sonnenfeld, uncredited as Marty's vomiting. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently was the off-screen noises. <laughs> for Marty when that's he's how, bombed. That's how important that's the stupid. vomiting yeah. was to this that's, film. Yeah. Always get your DP. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, you know, Barry Sonnenfeld, a I, I, very interesting cinematographer because he's somebody who has such a sense of style. And we've talked about him before in our When Harry Met Sally episode. His style in his cinematography always stands out to me and I've always always enjoyed it and it's actually uh, the cinematography from his films is really one of the first things that captured my attention in films at a young age that w- took me from beyond uh, beyond make or wanting to just enjoy films to actually wanting to get into the industry mm-hmm. uh, when I saw what you could really do with with the camera and how a movie could really come to life um, it was when the, you saw Wild Wild West it, <laughs> He was not the director of photography on that. <laughs> he was directing that. He's he is. I I, I don't know if I I'd love say it how you use that as justification. Uh, like a, <laughs> I, yeah, right. Uh-huh. It's uh, I, I'm not sure he's made a lot of good choices um, since he stepped out <laughs> of being a cinematographer. <laughs> he actually has some good films, but then I think once he uh, did Men in Black, I think that was about it. I don't think he's done anything good since then. Um, but anyway, going back to his cinematography, this was his first, um, feature film. I think he had done a documentary and a TV movie before this, and it really stands out. There's style all through it, not just the beautiful look of it that definitely has the, the, uh, you know, the cinematographer is a big part in that as far as the the color tones and how he's going to wa- get the film to look and everything you get kind of a lot of the interesting greens and and just it, it, he really plays to the noir conventions in in this and I really like everything about this way uh, the way that this film looks but he also uh, really brings the film to life and there's a lot of really interesting moves a lot of interesting dollies uh, and you know I I also have to give uh, uh, the Coens credit for this as well, but they don't, they haven't done this quite as much since they've uh, not been working with Barry Sonnenfeld. I I think he did their first three films really just doing a lot of interesting stuff. Uh, The, the one that stands out for me is when, when uh, Abby is looking at the, she's in the bar, the office of the bar and she's looking around and she senses that something is wrong, but we don't really know what, and then all of a sudden, it's like she just lays down on the floor and the camera kind of comes up and over her and she lands on her pillow in her bed and it's all one shot. And all of a sudden, but just by the way that she did that and the changing in the light and everything, she's now in another location. She's back in her bed thinking about what she was just looking at in the in the bar's office. And then, you know, we cut to another shot and we see, yes, she is in fact in the bed and it's just a really interesting way to play with the camera to bridge scenes and to just activate the viewer's mind and really kind of get them thinking about what's going on in this story and how people are moving through the 
this world. I, I absolutely agree with that, and I think you know there was a there there's another sequence the the nightmare sequence is I think another uh, another one that plays a, a similar sort of trick is, you know her uh, you know uh, walking in and seeing, um, you know, the uh, what's his name I already lost it, Ray. Yes, uh, and uh, and then she wakes up in in bed. It was just a, it's an interesting transition, and I, I I think you you really see that. For me, the the uh, you know the most interesting sequence in the uh, film visually is the the nighttime you know during the ballet. It's the nighttime burial scene. Uh, I love the way they play with these uh, lines of the um, of the farm. Uh, you know, lines in the dirt, the the plow lines in the dirt, and I, I you know this long dolly shot. Uh, that passes the car and leads all the way to, um, you know, to Getz, uh, you know, digging, uh, ready to throw the body in is, is just fantastic. A lot of great smooth moves. And it's a scene you could play with handheld mm -hmm. where it, it would bring a lot more of that tension to the scene. But the way that he plays it with these slow tracking shots so as fluid. they're moving, it's, it really almost, I don't know, there's something almost a little more haunting about it. One of the, uh, you know, there's an interesting uh, clip on, uh, you know, one of the YouTube interviews of the Coen brothers that uh, where they're talking about this sense of uh, the visual style and they're talking about just sort of what they're playing with in terms of the, the color of the film and how they, you know, if you're going for a film noir film, you know, sort of paying homage to this dark genre, yet they didn't want to make it in black and white uh, and ended up shooting it, uh, you know, the way it ends up being shot, it's very sort of, uh, the color is very suppressed until you see the it, until the color elements that always come from a light source. And I hadn't noticed this the first time I saw the film, but but that's really true. There's just a real uh, uh, sort of frivolous use of neon uh, mm -hmm. to to bring the color elements in the film uh, out. You know, when you're when you're uh, watching it, it's it otherwise looks uh, you know sort of a burnt kind of sepia um, uh, tone to the film, and yet you know then you see this bright pink. Uh, bright green neon, you know, mm -hmm. car headlights that just sort of bright up. So all the color is coming from from light sources, uh, specific and intentional light sources. I think they did. A, it's just beautiful. Yeah, it absolutely is. Yeah, I, he's a great cinematographer. You know, I will say the one shot in this film that I, I, I always go back and forth if I if I like it or not, although I usually lean on the side that I don't like it. It's when... Uh, Julian, uh, he's gone into the house, surprised her, and it's almost like he's he's you know kidnapped her. He's pulled her out of the house, and he's gonna he's gonna take her by force or something. As soon as they get outside, there's this crazy shot that totally feels like it's out of the Evil Dead. It's like a total Sam Raimi shot where the camera comes swooping along. At I, I swear, every time I see it, I feel like I'm at the dog's point of view, and the dog yes. is going to be attacking. It's like this, this dog's eye view zipping across the lawn, leaping up into her face as he's kind of holding her hostage But there, there. is no dog. And there is no dog. It's like, it's, and, and, but the problem it, that, with that is the, that there is a dog in the film. Yeah, and that's why I always expect the dog to be like jumping up and ready to bite somebody. And I, you know, it just, that's the one shot that really kind of throws me every time I see it. I feel like it's really showy and it's not motivated by anything. Yeah, totally agree. That one, that, that jars me every time. Yeah. It, yeah. Because you want that, that point in the film, you want the dog to come up and rescue her. Yeah. Uh, you know, and so that's kind of what your gut is telling you is going to happen as soon as they use that trick. Doesn't, doesn't work doesn't it just doesn't work no absolutely not all right what else you got you know I, we've mentioned mm Emmett walsh but i i just have to say how fun he is to watch in this and i find it so interesting that they wrote the role with him in mind like they knew that he was the guy who had to play the part and i think that's great i i love it when people are so taken by an actor that they they write a part for them, get them in there because it's just the right person for the job. Luckily, he uh, he took it. I mean, he's been acting since the late '60s, so he's he had been in plenty of things by the time they came knocking at his door. But uh, they obviously uh, um, convinced him, and he had a, a great great 
<laughs> just character to play. So much fun to watch. And, you know, I mean, geez, he's almost 80 years old. He's still acting. I mean, he's a busy, busy guy who's been in this business forever. He really has. And, I, you know, you hear his voice. I, I don't know. I hear his voice and I think, man, there's a guy who was meant to play uh, in Blade Runner. Yeah. It all comes back to Blade Runner. That's right. Uh, great actor. Just great actor. Yeah. Oh, he's fantastic. Oh. Um, so there's M.M. Well, there are only really four characters in this, uh, primary characters in this film. It's a, it's a very small piece. And there's one of the, you know, one of the comments that I uh, read about this film, one of the bits of commentary on the budget was that, you know, it was made for not a lot of money. And yet it's one of those rare films that was made on a shoestring that felt as if it was made for exactly the amount of money that it required. Yeah, it really does. It feels like an indie film that had the right amount of money yeah. and because everything feels like it's there. It has a purpose. It doesn't feel cheap. It doesn't feel like uh, the walls are, are wobbling because they're all sets. Um, but it doesn't feel like there's it's too big for its britches it just feels right. it does feel right yeah yeah i agree with that right. it looks like what do you, what do you have for the budget 1.5 million that's what i look at that's what i came up with yeah uh which actually now that i think about it it seems kind of like a lot of movie or a lot of money but <laughs> yeah for the, for the time i mean that yeah was, you know we're talking you know an independent film made in 1984 for and, and a half that's, that is a lot of money for, I mean, they raised it. This was the Coen Brothers' first film. They raised this money from, from what I've heard is from, you know, independently from Minneapolis uh, business people, uh, you know, where they grew up. Uh, you know, in today's dollars, it's just over $3 million. I have worked on, uh, in, you know, a number of independent films that have all been done for under a million. So, I mean, this is, this is a good chunk of money. Yeah, I mean, it's a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but it it uh, it met with how would you characterize box office success? It did uh, it did well enough for itself to give the Coen Brothers uh, a a good career. <laughs> How's that? This film <laughs> it it premiered I believe at Sundance that year and won the uh, the jury prize there and uh, it really kind of shot them into the spotlight. Everybody was talking about them. Uh, for the most part, people were loving them. Uh, if you look at somebody like, uh, um, who was it? I think it's Pauline Kael. In her review, this is the first paragraph of her review. Blood Simple has no sense of what we normally think of as reality, and it has no connections with experience. It's not a great exercise in style either. It derives from pop sources, from movies such as Diabolique and grubby B pictures and hard-boiled steamy fiction such as that of James M. Cain. It's so derivative that it isn't a thriller. It's a crude, ghoulish comedy on thriller themes. The director, Joel Cohen, who wrote the screenplay with his brother Ethan, who was the producer, is inventive and amusing when it comes to highly composed camera setups or burying someone alive, but he doesn't seem to know what to do with the actors. They give their words too much deliber deliberation and weight, and they always look primed for the camera, so they come across as amateurs. Not somebody who seemed to connect with the film, <laughs> but enough people did, and enough people still do to this day. That I mean, I think Roger Ebert put this uh, as one of his top ten films of the year when it came out. This was a film that I think you could call divisive. It did well enough in the box office to... Uh, get attention and everything. You know, it it uh, it made. What did I see? The total gross was. Um, this was not counting the the director's cut that was re released around two thousand one or two. Um, it made about two point seven million worldwide. Um, adjusted, that's five point eight million. So it's twenty twenty seven and a half thousand per finished minute adjusted for inflation. It did, it did well enough for itself, but um, it, it made people take notice of these filmmakers who were then able to get a lot of other films made. But they've always had this kind of back and forth with people. Some people say that they um, have just amazing style. They take Hollywood convention, but do a lot of really interesting art film sorts of things with it play around with what other directors have done. A lot of the detractors say their file, their films are all style with no substance. 
They are too snarky for their own good. They are uh, very not sympathetic at all with any of their characters. So there's always this dividing line with the Coen brothers, and I can see that in many of their films. And I think that's why I'm so 50-50 on their films. I mean, I like a lot of their films, and I don't like a lot of their films. But I, what I, I do enjoy about their films is that I always enjoy going to their films, and even if I don't like it, I always feel like I'm seeing something interesting. I never feel like I'm wasting time. Yeah, I agree with that. And, I, you know, I think it'll be interesting to talk about these other, the, the, the next round of films that we're going to get from, uh, or, or the next in this round of films that we're going to get from the Coen brothers. Um, because I think we, I think you and I in particular are divided on some of them um, in, in just that way. That, yeah. That, uh, um, but but never not something to talk about uh, exactly on these films. So uh, we could we could go through every one of their films, yeah. and even if we don't, even if we both don't like it, I feel like there's ton to talk about. Yeah, yeah, I do too. Um, what else do you have on your on your notes list? I'm sure you just one one last little thing. Things. Just one last little thing. Right. Um, Zhang Yimou, uh, a wonderful director in his own right decided for some reason to remake this film as a, uh, a, a story that I, I believe it was released called A Woman, A Gun, and a Noodle Shop. The comic remake. Yes. It, 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 uh, it did well in China, but um, it bombed when it was released here. And Ebert said it was so gauche and graceless that I involuntarily moaned in disgust. <laughs> I've never seen it. I'm curious to watch it and just see what made it so bad. But, you know, as somebody who claims to have been such a, uh, a fan of the original when he first saw it, uh, Zhang Yimou, it just sounds like he really did not do it justice at all when he decided to remake it. That's funny. Yeah, funny and sad. Funny and sad. Um, you know, I'm, I'm looking, I think I found something. I just want to make a quick correction and see if this is a correction or not. You said it premiered at Sundays. I think it premiered at Toronto, but the 2000 director's cut premiered at Sundance. Um, and that was, uh, what I wanted you to talk about the director's cut. So what was the difference between the director's cut? Because I, you know, I've, the, yeah. I've read about it. I have not seen it. The version I'm watching is the original. Are you sure? No. <laughs> but I didn't have the little thing at the beginning. You said there was a thing. Well, I don't know if it's if it's really. I like I I don't know how the different versions are. It's on mine, but I don't know if it, if every like the digital copies. I don't know what what you're watching. Sure anyway, what you're watching. in uh, I don't remember what year it was. I, I want to <laughs> say it's 2001 or two. Um, they decided they, to uh, restore the film and do a director's cut, which is actually a little tighter than the original cut. It was shortened by about four, three or four minutes. And it's when it played in the theater and actually on the on the disc, it has this really funny intro um, by this guy who runs this company, Forever Young Films. And he talks about how they remastered it in ultra ultrasound, a Lucas process, and how the film had been digitally swabbed, the boring parts had been taken out, and other things added. And it's it's this it's it's this hilarious like mocking of what people think of as director's cuts. And I, I, my understanding is that it really is just they tightened some things up, they fixed something with some music rights as far as a song that they had to change at one point. And and that was really it. It's but, not much of a change, right? And and the final running time with this edition is the exact same running time as the first film. No, it's three as minutes. As I short, understood, three minutes shorter. It's shorter. Yeah, it's it's shorter. It's about three minutes shorter. All right, I'm checking the length of mine. Hold on. You do the original you cut was do. 99 minutes, and the director's cut was about 95 or six minutes. So, well, mine's 96 you. minutes. There you go. So which is it? Which so you saw the director's cut. I did. Ninety six is smaller than ninety nine. Well, and this is what I this is what I was saying that it's with the because I did not have. This is why I'm just telling you what I read. I think I read it on Ebert that the director's cut 
was the same length if you include that thing, the preamble. Oh, and that's maybe what if makes you include it so the comical. preamble. Yes. Yeah. That their director's cut was the same length as the original film, that they cut a bunch of stuff and added a preamble just to make it the same length as the original film. That would be pretty funny if they intentionally did that. Do you want to talk about the other thing? The fantastic commentary? <laughs> there really is some it, utterly it, fantastic commentary. It may be the best commentary I've ever heard. Yeah, if if you're a fan of audio if you're a fan of audio commentary or if you're not a fan of audio commentary, this is the commentary it, for you. It is so worth listening to. It's it's a mock commentary making fun of really audio commentaries and the whole idea of it because the person who they have uh, doing the commentary in this film, which is commentary written by Joel and Ethan Cohen, is some of the funniest stuff because the guy is completely wrong about everything. And he goes off on just like crazy tangents about like how the when the film that these these Cohen brothers had made was this amazing piece of work, but because of this test screening and people didn't understand it, because of this this crazy this this story about this this detective who was from Bulgaria and how he had gone back to his homeland because this this uh, <laughs> the lighter was his father's <laughs> who was the like the, the the leader of Bulgaria or something and. <laughs> <laughs> and how the studio didn't understand it, so they cut all of that out, and this new cut was just so much not what the original cut was. I mean, it's it's a hilarious commentary that is so uh, just tongue in cheek, poking fun at commentaries, and it's so much fun to listen to. The dog is an animatronic, uh, you know, the fly is this digital fly, and they could only include it in so many shots because it was all digital. <laughs> because it was super expensive. <laughs> it was super expensive. <laughs> The uh, and and people can find this commentary where it is on the 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 DVD release and the Blu-ray release that came out uh, in after the director's cut and uh, so just look for uh, the version that has a commentary on it and uh, and enjoy. All right, are you ready to rank? I am ready to rank. You can find us over at flickchart.com/slash/the next reel where we have our uh, our golden list. And, but now we're updating on Letterboxd, too, so you should find us there, too, right? Absolutely. All right. Both places. All right. Blood Simple or Moon? I'm, I'm Blood Simple. I will watch this more than I will watch Moon. All right. <clears throat> All right. No you offense know, to Duncan I, Jones. No, I just love, I love Blood Simple. All right. Fine. I, <laughs> I was going to say that's going to be a hard one for me, but apparently it's not for some of us. That's right. Blood Simple. Now, this one's harder. This one, I, I... Blood Simple or The Social Network? I I think I'd have to go Social Network. Yeah, me too. See, for I was really excited and passionate about this movie. I do love this movie, but we have seen a lot of movies that we love. We, uh, you know, yeah. <clears throat> That's we, our curse. We, we were called movies we, we like in, at one point. <laughs> we got in trouble. We should add, we got in trouble last week because we we had a particular miscreant malcontent of a listener who says that we misranked uh it happened one night that's right well i just want to say this no we didn't <laughs> wow you tell him <laughs> toppy I really don't, I don't have anything better. It's hard. This is a curse, this thing we do, this ranking thing. Why would we do this it to is, ourselves? It's a curse. It is, but that's the joy. Is That's why Flick Chart is so much fun. All right. What's next? All right. Blood Simple or The Town? Blood Simple. I will do that, too. Blood Simple or The Natural? Blood Simple. I agree. Blood Simple or Zero Dark Thirty? Zero Dark Thirty. <sighs> I will go with Zero Dark Thirty as well. Blood Simple or Marathon Man? Blood Simple. I agree. All right. 30 out of 103. I noticed it didn't give us Blood Simple or It Happened One Night. <laughs> it didn't. <laughs> we can't tell Flickchart to give us the rankings we want to rank. It'd be Blood Simple. <laughs> so there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, awesome. So where do we go next week? We're doing uh, Miller's Crossing. Yeah, we're going to skip over the funny Raising Arizona, which is one of my all-time favorite comedies. I absolutely love it. 
going to skip it, though, because we're doing the dramas of the brothers. We are. I think that's going to upset some people because I think there we've had people ask us to do Coens, and I think their expectation is we're going to do uh, Raising Arizona, Big Lebowski, right? I mean, yeah, probably. Yeah, and we're totally not going to do any of those films right now. We're going to do those no. later. That's right. That's coming another time. It'll oh. be in another Cohen series. Yes. Yeah, we, we'll come back. Yes. And uh, that'll be episode uh, 96 of the next. We're cruising up toward episode 100. I feel like we should do something special. I, what I think we should do something special. I wonder what that'll be. Hmm. I don't know, but I bet it will be special. That'll be for future Pete and future Andy to deal with. That's right. All right. Uh, good talk. Go to bed. Thank you. I am going to lozenge my throat. Mm. Lozenge. It is hard to believe that we have been having in-depth weekly conversations about movies since 2011. So many great conversations over the years about so many great movies. And some stinkers. Well, true. But you know, producing this show week after week requires a ton of work behind the scenes. If you'd like to help support our efforts, one easy way is by using our Originals page when shopping for books and movies that we've covered. Just visit thenextreel.com slash originals. Your purchases made through our links give us a small commission at no extra cost to you and allow us to keep having these great discussions. In Season 3, we covered even more great adaptations like The Night of the Hunter and It Happened One Night both part of our Couples on the Run series. We talked about No Country for Old Men, the Coen brothers so rarely adapt someone else's work. We had some fun rom-com adaptations like About a Boy, based on the Nick Hornby novel, and Nick and Nora's Infinite Playlist, adapted from Rachel Cohn and David Levithan's book. In our terribly and naively named foreign language series, we discussed the brilliant City of God and the Diving Bell and the Butterfly, which I won't ever be able to watch again, ever. But could you read the original memoir? I don't know, maybe? We had our Richard Dysart series with adaptations like The Day of the Locust and Being There. Plus, we had that fantastic interview with the man himself. <laughs> the one where we had him sit on the floor? Because this chair was so squeaky. <laughs> Good times. We did our first Tom Hanks series with Forrest Gump adapted from Winston Groom's novel, plus Apollo 13 based on Lost Moon by Jim Lovell. And we did another year series looking at films from 1981, including Das Boot, Gallipoli, and Thief all based on books. Listeners can dive deeper into all of these original stories and more at thenextreel.com slash originals. Every book, play, movie, video game. Video game. <laughs> you bet. We have talked about some video game adaptations as well. It doesn't matter the source, just follow the link. Every purchase supports the podcast. Check out the full list at thenextreel.com slash originals and get reading, watching, performing, or playing today.